Okay, so before we arrive at Soufflo, I thought of show, uh, presenting Jules Hardouin Mansart because he just preceded him and as Baroque preceded uh, neoclassical architecture, which is represented by Soufflo. And Mansart, you know, is, was a master of Baroque, um, Baroque architecture. And it's uh, incredible in a way how how quickly actually the Baroque was replaced by uh, neoclassicism. So, I mean, not so quickly, but uh, in, in a few years, actually, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, uh, 30 years at the most, uh, Baroque, which was so, uh, you know, uh, sometimes flamboyant and, and rich and, uh, and, you know, complex and so on, uh, then uh, came to flow with the simpler forms of, uh, of architecture. So again, before Soufflo, we look quickly, or not so quickly, because I have a lot of things here to show and talk about uh, Mansart. Uh, even his hair, as you can see, this is not the hair of a, of a neoclassicist. This is the, well, it's, it's, it's a wig, of course, but uh, this is the wig of a man who believed in different gods than, uh, than um, Soufflo. I imagine Soufflo was bold, like me, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, I'm not insisting too much because we'll talk at some other time about Mansart. I just want to show from where Soufflo came. And, uh, you know, he built uh, important things, Place Vendôme, uh, Chapelle de, de Zenvali, the, the Grand the tri Trianon uh, uh, of the Palace of Versailles. And he worked for Louis XIV, while Soufflo worked for Louis XV, uh, the grand, uh, uh, grandson of Louis uh, uh, Le Soleil, or, uh, you know, the Sun King, uh, Louis XIV. And uh, it's interesting, Louis uh, XIV was actually the longest monarch in Europe ever. I mean, in terms of monarchy, he, 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 he led France for 70 years, and his great-grandson uh, led it for uh, 50 years the second longest, um, you know, uh, leading time of uh, monarchy in, in Europe. Anyway, so, uh, you know, people with, uh, they, they, they enjoy their wigs and the architecture was connected with, uh, with the wigs in a way, you know, it was, was, uh, was um, uh, an architecture that refused to accept the, the bareness of boldness. So everybody was, you know, quite, uh, you know, uh, impressive in terms of the coiffure. Anyway, um, so we are dealing with a Baroque architect par excellence in France, but in France, the Baroque was, was not uh, as, uh, as extravagant as in some other countries. Anyway, some drawings. Uh, again, I go quickly because the subject of, of the talk today is actually Soufflo, the neoclassicist. I just wanted to show the contrast between Mansart and Soufflo. And even the drawings are more, uh, you know, more rich, more detailed, uh, more, anyway, the church of the, of the Zenvalid, uh, um, which is a very important uh, place in, in, in Paris. And uh, here is also, um, you know, Napoleon uh, uh, tomb and, uh, and no one can miss it, but, Please remember this image, then when we, when we arrive at the Pantheon, which also uses the dome and uh, it's, 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 it's an architecture, you know, of power, of centrality, but different because neoclassicism is different from the Baroque. But again, the Baroque in France is not so devoid of, of uh, some connections with some kind of rationalism or is more tempered, I think. Napoleon's tomb is here. So again, Mansart did the structure, the building, uh, and uh, it's, you know, you cannot miss it. Napoleon's uh, tomb is, is for all to see, it's right in the center. Um, anyway, um, Napoleon, who died at 51, you know, and in unglorious uh, circumstances, this is what happens. You know, uh, Louis XVI was decapitated. So here we are, you know, it, uh, human beings are never at peace with themselves. They kill their heroes, they kill their emperors, 
uh, you know, and, and nothing really changed. You know, we are still at war with each other, and uh, yeah, what can we do? So again, Mansar, um, the Church of the Zenvalid uh, in in Paris. So I go a little bit quickly because we want to arrive at Soufflo. There isn't actually such a huge difference between the French Baroque uh, and, 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 and the neoclassicism, uh, the French neoclassicism. I think uh, the French spirit uh, is uh, kind of in between. Uh, it was even said that the French are kind of between the Germans and the Italians. So there is the order of the Germans and the disorder, so to speak, of the Italians. So they they're in between. So, so is their architecture. When is uh, Baroque is not excessively Baroque, and when it is neoclassical, it is not very, very uh, rigidly uh, um, neoclassical or, or classical. Anyway, um, this is actually the architect. Uh, well, the times are gone when nobody would make uh, today a sculpture or a statue with the architect, even in front of a great masterpiece. I propose something like this for John Woodson in, uh, in front of the opera in Sydney. Not a, not a statue, a me memorial. Uh, but um, anyway, might, maybe one day I'll show you the, um, uh, the project. Well, the interior is a different story. Here there is uh, opulence, no doubt. This is Baroque, clearly. But uh, the interior may be even a neoclassical building indulges in some riches. So the wigs, the crystals, the chandeliers, uh, all of these things connect, you know, they believed in, uh, in uh, opulence. The Royal Chapel in Versailles, also by Mansar, um, you know, they, they built for, 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 uh, for the king, you know, for the emperor, for the nobility, not for proletarians. Uh, those people uh, lived without glory and, uh, you know, uh, no architects would work for them, as opposed to Victor Bourgeois, who worked for, uh, well, even him uh, worked for, um, you know, uh, kind of a, for well-to-do, you know, who, who, who afforded to have a house built by Victor Bourgeois. Uh, still people with some, uh, <laughs> some financial power, if, if nothing else. Anyway, um, the Grand Tri Trianon in Versailles, also by, by Mansart. So we are dealing here with a paradigmatic Baroque French architect. Uh, Mansard. There are actually two Mansards. Well, this is one of them, and you know the the most important in a way uh, for for Baroque architecture. Um, so opulence, kings, queens, large spaces, large vistas. Plus the victoire, of course, victories, you know, it's all about power. Uh, plus the victoire in, in Paris. And uh, yes, the king is on a, on a, on a horse, which seems in, invincible. Uh, and this was the time. And it, I understand it was Louis Le Soleil who, you know, led France for 70 years. When, since he was a kid, you know, he... <laughs> I mean, incredible, 70 years, he was the monarch absolu uh, in, in France. And this was his architect or one of his architects. Anyway, um, Place Vendôme, of course, again, uh, great, uh, great place, great, great plazas. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, they glorify, you know, the, the king's son or the sun king. And Soufflo came after Mansart, and he served, as I said, Louis the Sixteenth, not the uh, the Fifteenth, not Louis the Fourteenth, as as Mansart, but still a king, and he also led France for fifty years, not seventy, but still half a century, not bad. And the most famous work by Soufflo, which is the Pantheon in in Paris, was built at the request of Louis the Fifteenth 
because he, apparently, from what I read, he was ill, and he said, if, if, uh, if I get well, I want to erect a church for Saint Genevieve, uh, uh, you know, the, the revered um, uh, saint in, in French uh, um, culture, uh, and uh, that's what the Pantheon initially was supposed to be, a church for Saint Genevieve. Anyway, we'll arrive at the Pantheon. You see the sun, the, you know, gloriously expanding its rays all over. Um, okay, Mansar, we had enough of your glorious Baroque architecture. We'll go now quickly to, to but not before we see this Place Royale in Dijon, also by Mansar. Um, everything is, is uh, you know, working just fine because when you work for uh, the king, the sun king, uh, it cannot be otherwise. And, uh, and uh, you know, lucky times, I would guess. You wear a voluptuous uh, wig and you build for the Sun King and, you know, nothing could be better. Anyway, uh, Chateau de Dampierre, this was the time, you know, who had power had power, who didn't disappear in the fog of history. What can you do? Life is not fair uh, on this earth. Although the, the Orthodox modernists believed in fairness and believed in equality and believed in social uh, concerns and values, Chateau de Marly, Pavillon Marseille in Vanf, uh, anyway, um, we'll talk more in detail about Mansar when, when his birthday will show up and it will one, uh, one time. Uh, you see, this is, you, you can't truly really say this is Baroque. It's, it's rather classical or neoclassical. So that's what I'm saying. The transition bet between the Baroque and the neoclassical is, is rather smooth in, 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 in French culture. But here, please uh, remember this image if you are so kind, because I want to show you today uh, another uh, PowerPoint presentation on the sphere in architecture. This is a subject that interests me, because I think the sphere traditionally, or part of a sphere, was used to symbolize the heaven, or the divine even. And today, we totally devoided the sphere of that meaning, and I'll show you nine examples of contemporary architecture by some very important architects today who employ the sphere, but devoid it of these connotations. And, and I think they are unconvincing. And I'm talking about Foster, I'm talking about Renzo Piano, I'm talking about Berke Ingels, uh, and um, I think they are unconvincing, and I'm very surprised that they don't think about the symbolism of the sphere. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is the architect. Can you imagine, can you ima imagine today an architect, uh, you know, accepting even to be uh, represented in this way? No way, he, even the most arrogant. He was not arrogant, but this was the time then. Anyway. And um, okay, that's it. So now, yeah, you know, allow me to show you because I, I mentioned that sphere in architecture in relation with that work by, by, uh, by Mansart. I will show you, before I show Soufflo, I will show you this uh, beginning of a, of a larger presentation on the sphere in architecture, where I show contemporary works uh, that I think are, uh, are uh, intriguing because they play dangerously, I think, with an uh, with a architectural uh, form or shape uh, uh, that, that devoided of its uh, traditional meanings becomes, I think, very problematic. And this is a, a, it's not yet finalized, this PowerPoint presentation, but I'll show you about 50 images that, that were published today by Desin. So the Taipei Performing Art Center by Oma in, uh, in Taipei, Taiwan. So a spherical structure. So you remember the work by Mansar, right? Which I just showed. But this one by Oma, by Rem Kolhas, described as a suspended planet docking with a cube. 
docking with the cube. It's good that they wanted to show the, 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 the sphere in, in its dialectics with the cube, but they do it without uh, concern for their symbolisms. That continuous and audit contains an auditorium is the most prominent feature of this performing art center. The performer is nearing completion and is set to open in 2020. So this is seven years later than originally planned. I find it ridiculous. I am really sorry, Mr. Kolhas, but I, 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 it's hard for me to respect the architect who did this. It, it, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's. Um, uh, I think it's a ridiculous uh, uh, architecture, you know. Uh, if you compare with a building by Mansar, which was not a masterpiece perhaps, but this one is so, you know, to say that it's childish is, 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 is actually a compliment. It, 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 I don't know what you think and feel, but I, 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 I have no attraction at all, no affection for this kind of architecture. Look at it. So this is what happens when the human being uh, plays, plays, plays games with, um, with a symbolism that was uh, very serious and, and, and deep uh, uh, in human consciousness. That is the sphere represented the divine, represented the heavens, and by extension represented God. What do we have here? It's just, a, and it's not even a perfect sphere, but it doesn't matter. Uh, essentially, we are dealing with a with a with a heartless uh, sphere, with a despiritualized sphere. It's it's um, it, it's just a game, I think, a formal game. And uh, the fact that the sphere appears today with <clears throat> some uh, some um, insistence shows that we miss something, and I think we do miss something. But we cannot arrive at that something unless we reconsider our relationship with the world at large and get rid of the, uh, of the, of the arrogance of assuming that we are alone in this, on this earth and that there is nothing else besides us and that we are at the center, uh, that we are the measure of all things. And look at this. I, I think this is a bonanza, an architectural bonanza. It's not, a, it's not serious architecture. It's, I, 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 and we are talking about Rem Kolhas. I am talking about Oma, and you will see that Foster does the same thing, and uh, so does uh, uh, Bjarke Ingels. And I think these people are doing a disservice to architecture and to culture by uh, promoting, playing with forms which are devoid of the of the of the, the established symbolism. I'm not against innovation, no, but what I see here is is uh, um, is a world without uh, the gods. The gods departed, the heavens do not exist, uh, God is dead, and we just play with a sphere and becomes this empty, empty of meaning, uh, um, you know, uh, geometrical form, if I can call it so. That, and look at this. I mean, really, really, I, 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 I'm actually amazed. When Ren Kolhas looks at this, what does he think? What does he feel? Is he proud of this? You know, is this truly what we should be proud of? It's, I find it incredible actually. Anyway, uh, we move forward to others. Uh, now, Apple Marina by uh, Foster and Partners. The latest Apple store designed by British architecture studio Foster and Partners is a spherical building that appears to float within Singapore's Marina Bay. Set to open within the next couple of weeks, the store is completely surrounded by water and it will be and will be accessed by a bridge from the waterfront promenade and, and, and an utter underwater tunnel that connects it to the Marina Bay Sands shopping center. And look at this, another bonanza. I'm really sorry. I, I mean, for me, this is not architecture. It is really a very sad example of what uh, famous architecture firms and famous architects do when they, uh, um, when they are actually too full of themselves because this fear is supposed to mean something else. 
in 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 class in traditional architecture most you know i'm talking mainly but maybe not just in in um, in european architecture you know the great challenge was to translate from the cube to the sphere in other words from the earth to the sky and most churches were built like this you know and that transition from the cube to the sphere had the uh, complexities that uh, that um, illustrated um, the difficulties and yes the complexities of the relationship between man and the gods or god but today there are no gods there is no god and we just use the sphere because we are bored and we just place unless we think that apple is the new god and but is not and this is this this alarms me beyond measure because it doesn't matter how big is that uh, reddish uh, uh, apple painted on the sphere i refuse to accept that the fetishization of a, a technological company can replace the departed gods or god and uh, uh, again you know we are dealing with foster who is approaching death who is approaching the life beyond you know the afterlife and how come that he doesn't think of it you know how come that he doesn't think of the limits of life this this frivolous play with with uh, with just forms is i think very empty and it saddens me now we see the renzo piano this one is a little more interesting but still problematic so he added a glass sphere to the 1930s may company building in los angeles to create the academy museum of motion pictures so the main building will contain a collection of film mem memorabilia, including set designs, costumes, props, and interactive in installations, while a 1,000 seat theater topped by a terrace will occup occupy the spherical extension. This one is a little better, I think, because it has that second uh, skin, which um, uh, fragments the sphere uh and i don't know if it will remain there maybe it's, i imagine it remains there but i'm not i don't understand very well what is going on here but i still think the sphere is problematic in today's architecture uh, and when i say today i mean a, a world from which the gods departed from which god departed and the sphere doesn't represent any longer the beyond or the heavens or the sky and uh, uh, it's just devoid of its uh, um, established symbolism yeah of course we can build anything today but somehow i see a lot of emptiness as i see also emptiness in this work by adrian smith and gordon uh, gill uh, in the kazakhstan uh, pavilion i have seen the project but now i see that it was built known locally as nur Ale, museum of the future how incredible to dedicate a museum to the future. The museums are usually made for the past, not for the future. It's like saying the tomb of the future. Incredible. I, I find it amazing. So the museum of the future. Anyway, we go beyond this. This is the building. Again, I think it's an inflation, a human inflation showing in a way the arrogance of the human beings today. We are not gods. We are humiliated now by a virus that is almost dead. So how could we be like this? Of course, when he made this project, the virus didn't exist. We didn't know of. But from the perspective of today, when we are condemned to not leave our rooms because an almost dead virus, uh, um, uh, you know, risks of, uh, of, of killing us, we build this uh, empty, um, um, you know, um, um, you know, triumphalist architecture. I call it a triumphalist architecture. In all the cases that we saw until today, this is a triumphalism in which I do not believe. And look at this. I, it really saddens me. I am very sorry. I mean, uh, by comparison, Le Cabanon, that very modest hut by Le Corbusier, is infinitely superior. How could they build something like this? You know, just because we can, you know, yes, we can. Yes, we can, but was it worth it? I mean, the climate change is dwarfing us. The virus is dwarfing us. We have lots of problems. The seas are rising and we are building this nonsense because it is a nonsense. 
in my opinion, it is a total nonsense. But yes, it might look interesting here and there, inside, I don't know. But uh, essentially, it is a big, uh, uh, rounded uh, nonsense. Now look at another one. Uh, this one is interesting because of the structure, also by Adrian Smith and Gordon um, um, Gill. I showed it in a previous uh, uh, presentation more in detail. Here I have only one picture because this material is still developing and I, I want to have another discussion about the sphere and the cube in architecture. So spherical architecture will also be making an appearance at the Dubai Expo, which has been postponed from 2020 to 2021. With them designing a globe shaped plaza for the center of the Expo site. The plaza will be at the intersection of the Expo three thematic districts and will be topped with a spherical trellis that was deformed by the Expo's logo anyway. But this one also is saved by the fact that it's not a perfect sphere. It's fragmented by the way the skin is uh, uh, configured and also because it is cut at the bottom. So it's, it's, it's actually uh, standing on the earth. It's not uh, arrogantly claiming some kind of an independence from the earth. Now we see the, this uh, proposal for London or maybe it was even built by Populous. I didn't know about this architecture firm um, but in essence, these fears disappoint me, uh, disappoint me with their arrogance, you know, and it's very possible that, you know, after this pandemic, we will not be able to envision such things of, uh, of self-glorification, because this is what they seem to be for me, self-glorifications of a human being that forgot his or her limits. And inside, you know, here you have this ocean of people. Yes, we live at a time with a lot of population in the world, I agree. But do we have to bring one billion people inside a big sphere? Uh, I mean, of course, uh, the, here there are no uh, one billion people, but you understand, it's, it's a frighteningly large amount of people ad, uh, populating, uh, you know, the interior of a, of a sphere. Now, another one in this infamous American city, Las Vegas. Uh, this, they also designed, of course, again and again, this is about self-glorification and about triumphalism in the city of destitution, in the city of casinos uh, and losing one soul, we build this uh, big sphere, which means what? This is what I would like to ask uh, populace. It means what, this sphere? What does it mean? We have the sphere of the red apple of the big company, Apple, which just reached incredible profits of two trillions because we measure everything in money and everything in red apples and everything in huge spheres in which billions of people enjoy some other kind of entertainment. But in essence, we are immensely bored and now we are isolated in our rooms because an uh, almost non-existent, meaning almost dead virus, is uh, provoking panic in, 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 in the human society. I, I find this uh, almost fear also ridiculous. As ridiculous is, uh, you know, I mean, you know, this, uh, you know, 23,000 people, uh, you know, uh, looking at what? You know, look at this. I actually find this image, uh, it's ominous. It's either, it's something apocalyptical about it, you know. It's, it's, it's at the peak of our boredom, we envision exhibitions or shows that, uh, um, you know, are uh, almost apocalyptical in their nature, I think. Or this one. And then, of course, Bjarke Ingels couldn't uh, miss the occasion to be himself present with a, with a sphere the burning man sphere and, and uh, is it truly a burning man because a burning man would not say uh, yes is more a burning man would say uh, no is more because he's burning but the name of this um, well-known um, you know event in nevada was not given by him so we shouldn't accuse him for that but we should accuse him for this what is this actually again the gods departed, God is dead, and we are playing with these fears just because we are bored. And here comes the robot, and there is the sphere, which is, uh, you wonder how it is actually uh, 
not flying or still standing and then people are having fun, but not any longer because the almost dead virus is frightening us. So we are living in strange times. Important architects are actually, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, neglecting, um, you know, uh, established symbolisms and, uh, you know, serious matters, because I think it is a serious matter. How do you address architecture in its relationship with what is above the earth, you know, and um, the sphere was supposed to symbolize this above the earth, but is not any longer. Anyway, and now uh, Amazon spheres, uh, the American studio NBBJ uh, created three intersecting glass orbs alongside retail company, of course, of course, because these are the gods for us, Apple, eBay, Amazon, all big commercial enterprises that make a lot of money, but actually their leaders, I think, are immensely uh, bored. That's why they want to leave the earth and go to Mars. So the structures are filled with so-called cloud forest. What is this cloud forest gardens, which will be used as additional workspace for the company's employees and a green space for the public? This is an, another insult added, an injury added to, to nature. We enclose nature in these bubbles to show again that the human being is the measure of all things and nature is second or less, but it is not less. And again, its emissary, the almost dead virus is putting us uh, on, on our knees now. So this is the, the, you know, the, the triumphalism of capitalism. Look at this tall building, uh, uh, look at it, you know, and look at the sphere totally devoid of its uh, established uh, uh, symbolism. And I, 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 I cannot be optimistic when I see this, these architectures. I, I am optimistic when I see nature. Nature is beautiful. The trees are beautiful. The flowers are beautiful. The grass is beautiful. By why do, do, you, do we have to enclose it uh, in, in these uh, spherical prisons? This is my question. Why? Why do we have to imprison nature just to show again that we are the measure of all things sorry for my outbursts but i'm revolted i'm revolted and i'm also frightened anyway sorry about this and now i'll go to souffle uh, <laughs> who was supposed to be well uh, we didn't forget him so souffle is the 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 one to be not celebrated but paid homage to because he was um uh, he died on this day, uh, the 29th of August. So where, am, where are you, Monsieur Soufflot? Uh, let me see. Yes. Jacques Germain um, uh, Soufflot. Okay, so we go to slideshow from the beginning. So Jacques Germain Soufflot lived between 1713 and 1780. And Mansart, the one that I showed before, died in 1708. So five years after Mansart's death, Soufflo was born. Apparently, you know, the most important neoclassical French architect. I should have paid a little more attention to him, but at one moment I had difficulties to find the correct images with his work and I, 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 um, I arrested the presentation a little bit earlier than I should have and, and I apologize. This was the man. Apparently he was, uh, you know, very sensitive and uh, uh, you know, uh, capable man. Uh, he was uh, rather self-made. Uh, he was autodidact. He learned architecture by himself somehow, and he arrived at the position of serving uh, Louis the Fifteenth, uh, Louis um, the Fifteenth, who was, you know, following on the throne after the death of um, uh, Louis Le Soleil. Uh, he worked in Lyon uh, uh, for a good number of years, and he did the opera, which was uh, which which received a new part by uh, by Jean Nouvel, and what you see at the top here. So this was uh, Soufflot's uh, work, and this was what Jean Nouvel did above it. And unfortunately, I only have this image, and I, I truly apologize for it, because I think this is a good intervention by uh, Jean Nouvel who is a subtle architect, you see he uses 
the curve, but he doesn't play with a sphere the way the others did. And uh, I, think, I think he did a good uh, addition here to the existing building by Soufflot. And this building deserves a little um, richer presentation, and I apologize, I don't have it now. I was planning to add more images, but I didn't. We only have this image. But please remember, the opera in Lyon was initially built by Soufflot. It had some uh, changes in time, and then Nouvelle added what you see here at the top. Uh, this is the plan, uh, Soufflot's plan. And uh, this is how the building was, uh, you know, I don't know in what year. Uh, anyway, before, of course, um, uh, Nouvelle did what he did. Now, as you can see, there's not such a big difference between the neoclassical Soufflo and the Baroque Mansart, no. Now, Hotel Dieu, <laughs> an interesting name for, the, for a hotel, also in Lyon, and this one uh, still exists as he designed it. This one is a little bit more uh, subdued or reticent or even severe or austere. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a hotel, a quite a big hotel, as you can see. But, but because the French do have a tradition of um, imperial uh, presences in their history and in their culture, even here, you know, you have the, the symbol of power and centrality, just like in the time of Mansart and Louis Le Soleil. It couldn't be otherwise. I mean, you know, uh, you look at the map, of, of Paris, what do you see? You see centrality, you see converging avenues, no, towards l'Arc de Triomphe. Uh, and um, yeah, maybe that's why Bernard Chumi said, I've heard him in a conference saying that for him, Tokyo and New York were more contemporary and uh, he liked them more than Paris because Paris does have, even now, Paris has, or Paris has even today uh, this, um, you know, uh, this uh, centrality and this, this urbanism and this, you know, this, this flirtation with, with power, with the authority, with the king, you know, even if they are also the ones who brought into the world liberté, égalité, fraternité, meaning the French Revolution. Well, you know, and in fact, the French Revolution killed Louis the 16th, you know, by guillotine. Ah, the humans. Anyway, the Pantheon. Now, this is the most important work by Soufflot. And it's, as its name says, uh, Pantheon in Greek uh, means uh, the temple of all gods. Well, they don't have the gods there, but they have the, the you know, the, the, not the ashes or, you know, the, the remnants, so to speak, of, of, of famous, um, you know, glorious men in French culture. As Soufflot himself is buried here in the Pantheon, but the Pantheon initially was not built uh, to be a Pantheon, but to be a church. So one of the most impressive buildings of the neoclassical period, the Pantheon, Le Pantheon, originally built as the Church of Saint Genevieve, uh, was conceived as a monument to Paris and the French nation as much as it was the Church of Paris patron saint. So apparently the patron saint of Paris was Saint Genevieve. And uh, from what I read, uh, the king at that time, uh, Louis XV, uh, he was ill and he uh, declared that if he gets well, he will be the church for Saint Genevieve to whom he prayed. And he got well and he started to build the church with the help of uh, Soufflo. And uh, so initially it was a church, but it seems in its history, the Pantheon oscillated between being a church and being, uh, in other words, being a, a sacred building and being a secular building, a Pantheon for the great men of France. Victor Hugo is buried there. So Jacques uh, Germain Soufflot, its architect was highly praised for the design, although a few of his contemporaries thought he went too far in defining tra defying 
tradition and structural necessity. Soufflo was heralded during his life as the restorer of greatness in French architecture, and the building was lauded even before it was completed as one of the finest in the country. Soufflo's pupil Maximilien, uh, Maximilien Brebillon stated that the church design was meant to unite the purity and magnificence of Greek architecture with the lightness and daring of Gothic construction. He was referring to the way in which its classical forms, such as the tall Corinthian columns and the dome, were joined with a Gothic type of structure that included the use of concealed flying buttresses and relatively light stone uh, vaulting. So this is the building seen from, uh, from afar. Uh, it's, um, I think outside, besides this front on, and it's, it's, it's a rather austere building, uh, particularly, you know, the, the sides. I have seen it, but I never went inside, and now I regret. Apparently, the, its greatness is rather inside. And, uh, you know, it's, again, it, it was meant as a church, and now it is a building where the greatest of France, or some of the greatest, are buried there, here. And uh, Soufflo himself, as I said, found his uh, Domus Eterna inside this former church. Yes, the building is impressive. I mean, look at the, its size. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very big building. And um, no wonder it is considered one, one of the most impressive uh, buildings in Paris. Well, we have seen buildings like this. Of course, this is not, uh, but uh, this is one of the most glorious, uh, so to speak, in Paris. In other cities, there are the kind of similar building. He was inspired here also by St. Paul, by uh, Christopher, Sir Christopher Wren in London, and by uh, he had some other sources of inspiration. Um, but it, it is a good building, and I think the, is, the interior is, uh, is um, rather convincing. But you see, when I talked about the sphere, here you see that uh, you know, the building is evolving towards some kind of roundness or sphericity towards the top. And this we forgot. In this building, which was meant as a church, uh, there was still that relationship between the earth and the sky, uh, which, you know, society, um, um, you know, accepted. And, and uh, so, even when we look at this, this interior, we feel that there is some kind of, a, you know, transition between the, um, the, the telluric and the celestial, which is totally missing in those um, buildings that I showed from our contemporary architects. Because we don't have any, we do not think any longer in these terms. Uh, and uh, it, it's about um, uh, uh, this different uh, uh, relationship to cosmos. And anyway, there is much to say. But you see here, it's, it's the more you, you look upwards, the more you see that the building is evolving towards some kind of very, <laughs> somehow this, this, this word doesn't come uh, uh, as I wanted to 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 come, sphery should be sphericity, sphere no sphericity, spherical. Eh, maybe there isn't such a word. I should abandon it. But you understand, towards some kind of spherical, uh, um, you know, uh, configura configuration. It's clear, but but again, something like this is missing in our days. Anyway. Um, this was not done by him, the, the, the painting. Uh, then Hotel Marigny in Paris. Uh, I don't know if I have images. It was hard for me to find. Yes, I, I couldn't find. I, ah, I know I, I couldn't find. There is a Hotel Marigny, but it replaced the one that he built, which was destroyed. Now Chateau de Ley, uh, if I pronounce well, this is indeed uh, neoclassical, all right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very um, austere. And uh, I, here I actually see more of a, some kind of an Italian influence, but it is, it is uh, austere and almost Cartesian. 
uh, it's almost cubical. It almost announces some kind of modernity. If there were no chimneys and all that thing in the center uh, at the top, it would be an almost uh, modern building somehow. Now, Temple, Temple du Change, um, I don't know if it means, yeah, it should mean the Temple of Change in Lyon. It's a, it's a, it's a good building. I, I, I wouldn't call it really very neoclassical. This is somewhere in between the neoclassical and the Baroque, but um, it's, it, I think it's a good building and uh, it stands. It's, it's, uh, it's still alive, unchanged. In Lyon, not in Paris. He built essentially in, in Paris and in Lyon. I forgot that there is a, well, there are several videos on YouTube um, about uh, the Pantheon, but uh, you can watch them uh, by yourselves. Uh, in fact, you can find uh, everything on, on YouTube. Temple de Change. Now, Hotel de la Marine, this is a famous hotel because there are two identical or almost identical facing the Place de la Concorde. Uh, and uh, which is a very important, uh, um, you know, plaza in, in Paris. And it's possible that Louis the Sixteenth was uh, uh, had his um, head cut off right there with a guillotine, because that's where the, you know, the uh, the human sacrifices took place. This is the Marine uh, Hotel. Uh, from what I remember, Madonna, when she gives concerts, when she gave concerts in Paris, she lived here in this hotel. Uh, but Soufflo only did the initial um, uh, planning and he started the construction. Apparently, the, the, the facade was built by another architect. I forgot his name. I think Gabriel, uh, Ange Gabriel. Um, so what we see is actually not Soufflo, but Soufflo started the, the construction of this major hotel. And there is one identical uh, across the street. So there are two hotels facing uh, the famous uh, Place de la Concorde, where strangely in the middle stands a lonely Egyptian obelisk that was donated by the Egyptians uh, to the French. And, uh, you know, um, there is a book which I have, which is called Against Architecture, which is written by Denis Hollier, a professor of French at Yale University. And um, uh, he, he comments on this uh, empty monument, this displayed obelisk, Egyptian obelisk, which has no business in uh, Place de la Concorde. Um, anyway, um, so this is the Hotel de, de la Marine, uh, which house construction started, was started by Soufflo. Now, I called the Droit, uh, the school of, um, of uh, how say Droit uh, in English, uh, you know, uh, law, you know, is the school where the, law, the lawyers were formed. It's, it's, it's appropriate for, you see the, at <laughs> the top, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, indeed. Uh, but yes, the French brought to us Liberté, Galité, Fraternité, through the French Revolution and through Marianne, that um, symbol of, of France now, you know, the secular Maria. Okay, Liberté, Galité, Fraternité, this is where the lawyers are formed in Paris and this building was done by Soufflot. An older picture. He seemed to like these very tall uh, columns. I, I think these are Corinthians as well. Strangely, you know that you have a neoclassicist who uses Corinthian columns because it's known the Corinthian is even more in flower than the Ionian or Ionian. Yes, you have the Doric, the Ionic and the Corinthian and the Corinthian is, is the most anti um, um, classicism or uh, because it's 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 uh, it's almost rococo at the top at least but we all have contradictions so to speak so why not expect some from Soufflo as well uh, a picture without cars 
Faculté de Droit, Université de Paris. Now, this is a, an interesting building, Fontaine de la Croix du Tahoir uh, in Paris. Is, uh, it makes me almost think of uh, Le Doux a little bit. It's, uh, and this, you cannot say it's neoclassical, really. It's, uh, it's burlesque, in a way. Or, or it's some kind of a burlesque neoclassicism, if you can say something like this. Probably not. But it's interesting, I think. And um, I see there Ludovicus uh, the 16th, um, but maybe it was built during uh, the time of Ludovic the, uh, Louis the 15th. I don't know. Uh, Ludovicus the 16th was decapitated uh, in Place de la Concorde by the French Revolution. Uh, so you see, it's not easy to be. Um, now here it says Fontaine de la Croix du Trahoir édifié sous François Premier, but uh, I, I see it was uh, uh, rebuilt in 1775 by Soufflot. You see, Soufflot architect, Boiseau sculptor, and uh, François Premier was uh, was a great uh, king, but um, uh, earlier. Uh, he actually, François Premier was the king, the French king who understood uh, uh, the genius of uh, Leonardo and invited Leonardo to, to France in a residency and apparently Leonardo designed, and it's not very sure, the, that the double uh, um, helix uh, stair in the Chambord castle, which François Premier built. A very interesting king, François Premier, uh, very cultured and sensitive. But this is a fountain that was rebuilt in 1775 by Soufflot with the help of a sculptor. And again, it, it helps to have a sculptor on your side because uh, sculptures add something to the buildings, often. And if you have also a fountain, a functioning fountain, even better. Now, why is it called exactly a fountain? I don't know, because the function of the fountain is um, almost peripheral here. You know, it's like a habitation there, uh, some apartments or something. Anyway, that's how it is called, the fountain. You expect something else when you hear the word fountain, but the fountain is just at the bottom. Now, this is, I don't know exactly what Nympha is. I mean, I know, but, um, you know, how could this be a building? It's, it's, it's a building. I mean, it, it is a construction. You'll see it in Chateau. And it's part of a park. And it's interesting. Again, I think it's, it's some kind of a neoclassicism which assumes rusticity. Uh, 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 so it's rustic. It's rustic. And it's also, I, I wouldn't say it's really academic. Maybe it is a little bit. Anyway, it is a little bit surprising that he did this work and the previous work, he, considering that he is uh, valued as the, you know, the uh, eminent uh, neoclassical uh, French architect. But the dualities of the French spirit are present here too. Um, so. You know, you, you couldn't really say that this is neoclassical architecture. I, I couldn't. And not with these, um, you know, chromatic interventions, but it's, in, it's an interesting uh, structure. I, I don't know exactly what its function is. It's part of a park, maybe some kind of a pavilion. Um, you see, learning fair de soufflot. And maybe we need, again, this kind of buildings where the function is not very clear, you know, with a mysterious function, which we cannot truly identify. You know, very well done buildings, but do not have an established or clearly defined function. I, I think uh, we need such buildings. Or we should abstain for a while from building and allow, uh, you know, uh, for the resources to come back to life because we exploited them for too long, uh, I'm afraid. Okay, that's it with Soufflo. And now we go to the second, um, you know, uh, celebration. And this is this uh, 
modern uh, modern uh, Belgian architect considered the most important uh, Belgian modernist. Here I, I was a little bit, um, I indulged myself a little bit in um, passivity, not to say uh, laziness. I could have developed this power presentation more, but to land it with the three um, videos. I, I hear some, if you are so kind to turn off the, the microphone. Um, Okay, um, so we start with uh, with uh, with Victor Bourgeois, uh, the Belgian modernist architect. He is not so well known, but I think he he should be known, and. Uh, you know, he, we don't know too much about the modernists outside of the few very celebrated ones. He built some interesting houses. So Victor Bourgeois was a Belgian architect and urban planner, considered the greatest Belgian modernist architect. And he was uh, born, as you say, as you see, on the 29th of August in 1897. So Bourgeois was born in Charleroi and studied at the Académie Royale de Beaux-Arts in Bruxelles from 1914 through 1918, so exactly uh, during the, the First World War, and was mentored by Henry van der Velte. Not bad to have such a professor. Together with his brother Pierre Bourgeois, he founded several magazines, including Seven Arts, which was a, a famous um, arts magazine from 22 to 28. In 1927, Bourgeois became the only Belgian invited to design a house for the Weissenhof Estate exhibition in Stuttgart. And the following year, Bourgeois was a delegate to the first meeting of the Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, the famous SIAM, and the founding member of that organization. So uh, he was uh, valued and, uh, you know, he even had, uh, you know, I don't know if this was mutilated or not, the, the you know, the, the portrait in stone, or it's just a modern interpretation. I don't know. This was the man. Uh, so he died, I think, at 65. Larta's project was seen Agatha and Berham. I don't know what that is, uh, but it doesn't really matter which was the, the largest project, ah yes, was sustainable social housing, and we'll have some pictures of this. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> yeah, he, <clears throat> he dedicated his, uh, his talent and his efforts to housing mostly, uh, private residences and, uh, you know, social housing. So an apartment building, which I don't know if I found pictures of, uh, no, I didn't. Then Cité Modern, <clears throat> this is the, the modern city uh, just outside of, uh, of, of, of Bruxelles or Brussels. He built from 1922 to, to 1925. And uh, I, 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 I admire this kind of effort where, you know, with simple means you try to build decent housing, uh, houses uh, that are uh, affordable. You know, I, I think we need again uh, concern for those who are less privileged. And I think architects who have talent and have passion for architecture should uh, uh, build not just for the those with big money, uh, but uh, also for those with uh, less money, and uh, maybe even firstly for those with less money. In this sense, I respect very much the the tradition of the orthodox uh, modernism, which did have social concerns. Most of the stars today do not have such concerns. But at that time, at the beginning of modernism, there was such a concern. Uh, another picture with other houses. He built several um, complexes uh, there. And uh, this is an interesting house in the corner. Um, I, um, I particularly like what is happening here in the middle. You know, a little bit of indulgence in aesthetics, but why not? Um, after all, he was an architect not just a social worker, and that is good, I think. Uh, 
uh, you can tell he was a skillful architect. Um, they might not look very spectacular from uh, seen from today, but uh, I, I, I still admire them. And maybe this is a quality that they are not very spectacular. And because they are not meant to be very spectacular, they are not flashy, you know, they are not flamboyant. They are houses that uh, are decent and uh, affordable. Although maybe now at least these ones don't, maybe they are not so affordable or I don't know. Anyway, now uh, this is a, a, a blog where you can find more information about it. If you are interested, I can send you this presentation if you want. Um, this is a site plan. He built all those, um, uh, you know, uh, blocks of flats and, uh, you know, complexes. You know, they are not all identical and that's good. Maybe in time, you know, because what was con considered sustainable architecture in, in the 20s, uh, 100 years ago, today maybe it's considered uh, almost luxurious. It's possible. Now, an apartment building, which I don't know if I found pictures. No, I didn't. Uh, I had a problem really to, to, to find uh, uh, correct identifications for his works. Now we arrive at Maison Lamblot, which is uh, what you see. I don't know if I have another picture, no, just this one. But just in this picture, you can tell bourgeois was indeed uh, less bourgeois, actually, uh, more pro proletarian. I mean, he was, in a way, uh, uh, not scandalizing the bourgeoisie, but Although his name was Bourgeois, I think he had uh, proletarian uh, aspirations. This building is still, a, you know, uh, maybe even almost a luxurious villa, but look at this architectural language. It's very, you know, uh, deprived of, uh, you know, uh, in flowered, uh, you know, additions. It's, it's simple, it's, uh, it's modernistic, very modernistic compared to the building on the left and the building on the right. Now Maison Bourgeois, uh, I don't know if it's his own. <laughs> the name is the same from 1925. So built three years before uh, Villa Savoie of the Corbusier. And uh, these are the drawings. And you'll also see a picture with the building. Uh, I think it's very skillfully done and, uh, you know, still convincing. This is the building. It's modest, but it's also refined. And uh, I think it's a good building. Maybe it's his own house. After all, it's Maison uh, Bourgeois. But you can tell this, this, this picture was taken a long time ago because of the, the car that insinuates itself from the bottom uh, right side of the picture. So it's maybe even before the war. So to build at that time such a building was considered revolutionary. Now, Maison de Monsieur Latini, maybe uh, Avenue Voltaire in Brussels, 1926. I couldn't find pictures, or I did. Um, now, Maison Jesper, I think here we, we will have a chance to animate a little bit the presentation with a, with a YouTube. Uh, yes. Now, um, allow me to activate uh, uh, the video. Um, Unfortunately, I cannot incorporate the, the videos in my PowerPoint presentation because I have an old version of a PowerPoint presentation. Anyway, and, and unfortunately on, on uh, um, Vimeo, I cannot uh, create a full uh, screen, I think, unless some of you, someone from you knows how to do it because I, I tried and I, I failed. Anyway. The video begins by showing us the context of the street and then we arrive at the house uh, built by um, Bourgeois. That's it. I'm not very sure the video is very well done and I hope it does have sound. It should have sound. Yeah, when I watched it also, Maybe I shouldn't show it because it doesn't have sounds and to have a video without a sound is a little bit, uh, you know, 
not very pleasant. I really don't know why there is no sound. In the other two videos that I have, there is sound, but I don't know why in this one, no. Anyway, this is the house uh, that uh, Victor Bourgeois did, and he, you already know a little bit about him. is is uh, is a building that uh, is resolutely modern, but not outrageous modern. In fact, more outrageous now is the car in front of it, which is so passé. It irritates me that it doesn't have sound. I almost feel tempted like uh, giving up uh, watching this video, if you don't mind. It shows influences, you know, by this building, by Walter Gropius of Meyer and industrial. Uh... I don't understand why it doesn't have sound. Uh, forgive me, I'm going to stop this because it's... Uh... It's irritating me that it doesn't have sound. We go to, because we have two other videos and, uh, and uh, you know, we can, uh, we can uh, hear the, the sound, which is important, I think. Okay. So we go to the next uh, house. Uh, Maison Blanche. Casa Alba. <laughs> You know, the White House, but not the one in, uh, in Washington, D.C. And here I do have, um, uh, sorry, I do have um, uh, a video which I hope will, uh, will have the sound as well. Just a second. Okay. Do you hear anything? I don't understand. This one did have sound. Ah, yes, there is sound. <laughs> I don't know who made these videos. I don't think they are very inspired. Sorry. So he's near Brussels. So it's a luxurious house for someone who didn't give him a lot of instructions. It's a functional, uh, you know, architecture. Thank you. 
matériel fourni du paysage et de la vie quotidienne. En exploitant ces gens de la construction, nous pouvons atteindre des objectifs pour un soutien ensemble de vie, de vie de la stabilité, de l'ancrage et un aspect de bâtiment de la Le premier volume en France au premier étage un salon de thé qui se tiendra sous ce coup. Le deuxième volume sera celui du jardin en distanciant de la salle à manger et le dernier article à suivre la plante du garage en prolongation de la salle de la vie. Nous obtenons aussi une bonne petite fin et un bon petit dessin de la moyenne de nos petits enfants et un petit grâce à l'interaction de la vie et de la famille. Fortement inspiré par le Corbusier, le bourgeois reprend certains principes de l'architecture moderne, de l'écran mondial au travers de jardin pour se reposer au poteau. Il s'inspire pour ce projet de la vie à la roche pour la plantation en forme de bête, de la vie maison pour la fidèle échéance du garage reliée à la maison par une passerelle et du modèle du front pour la libération du sous-sol réservé à la culture. Okay, uh, and now uh, it didn't end.
Anyway, sorry, these videos, I don't think they are extremely interesting uh, and I apologize. I didn't make them, but I chose them because these are the only ones I found um, about um, his work. And now we arrive at the latest, uh, I, I think this is the last building by him, his contribution to the, um, to the Weissenhof colony in Stuttgart. And it was an honor to be there because, as you know, uh, you know, the master plan was done by Mies van der Rohe, and then there were important architects there, Mies and Le Corbusier and uh, Hans Scharoun. So to be part of this uh, experimental colony of uh, experiment with experimental uh, houses and uh, blocks of flats uh, was, was an honor. And uh, Victor Bourgeois was uh, invited there. So it was built in 1927, and we'll see his house, the one that he uh, proposed. Again, uh, it looks uh, banal, uh, um, but uh, you know it was built in 1927, and in a way, it is, it is banal. But um, if you look more carefully, you know at the plan, it, it has a level of integrity, and now it doesn't look spectacular from the 21st century but it was part of this very important um, architectural experiment which was the Weissenhof um, um, estate or the Weiss Weissenhof uh, colony in, in Stuttgart. I don't know if he painted it in pink at the time when he built it, but that's how it is now. Uh, but here the pink is a little pale and now will end this uh, presentation, which could have been a little more interesting, and I, I apologize, it, I, 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 I was not at, at my best uh, with, with, with uh, my presentation on Victor Bourgeois, but I can show you the, the video with this house in Weissenhof right now. And again, uh, I don't know why I cannot activate the full screen with video, Vimeo. Unfortunately, the language, I'm afraid, again, is French. Cette maison conçue en 1927 par Victor Bourgeois se situe dans la cité du Weissenhof à Stuttgart. Cet ensemble d'habitations modernes à l'initiative du Werkbund Allemand. L'objectif étant de montrer au grand public ses idées novatrices en matière de logement. Et parallèlement à cela, les progrès réalisés so, you know, for those of you who do not know French, she says that um, maybe you understood, but I think it's important to mention this. This uh, experiment in housing was built by the German Werkbund um, to show to the public, you know, various ways of modernistic or new ways of, of building houses. And all this complex was, was uh, made uh, of uh, participations by very important architects of the day. As I said, uh, Mies did the site plan, the master plan, and then Mies himself has a house there. And Le Corbusier has uh, uh, this long one, I think it's by him. Hans Scharoun has uh, uh, one and, uh, and uh, Bourgeois is somewhere here too. Anyway, we'll continue. But if you arrive in Stuttgart, please do not uh, neglect to visit because it's an important uh, architectural and social experiment. Dans la construction d'habitations, grâce aux nouvelles techniques et aux équipements développés par l'industrie. Le plan d'ensemble fut confié à Miss Van der Rohe, qui fit un grand nombre d'essais d'aménagement. Celui-ci désirait créer un lien entre chaque construction du site, en imbriquant et en entrecroisant les volumes. Le 
les organisateurs poussèrent finalement Miss Van de Roo à dessiner un plan plus traditionnel. Ces habitations furent dès lors conçues individuellement par différents architectes, tels que Miss Van de Roo, qui réalisait un ensemble de logements, Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius et Peter Behrens, tous étant devenus par la suite de grands représentants du mouvement moderne. C'est dans ce cadre que Victor Bourgeois fut amené à réaliser une habitation. La maison se situe à l'extrémité de la cité. Sur la parcelle numéro 10, est placé le long d'un axe créé par la route. Le terrain de forme trapézoïdale est traversé par un chemin qui conduit à l'entrée principale de la maison. Celle-ci étant placée en retrait par rapport à la rue. Les entrées sont les éléments les plus caractéristiques de l'architecture de Victor Bourgeois. Celles-ci sont hiérarchisées entre l'entrée principale, le service et secondaire menant au jardin situé à l'avant du bâtiment. La maison fut conçue de manière stratifiée, sans liaison entre les différents étages. Le rez-de-chaussée, surélevé d'un mètre du sol, est utilisé pour les fonctions de jour, telles que un hall d'entrée donnant sur la cage d'escalier et la cuisine, ainsi que la pièce de vie servant de salon et de salle à manger. Le premier étage est consacré aux fonctions de nuit. Des escaliers donnent sur le couloir. Celui-ci distribue les trois chambres et la salle de bain. Le bureau du maître d'ouvrage, le docteur Bonn, se situe également à l'étage. Le sous-sol n'est pas enterré totalement et est utilisé pour le stockage des aliments et la buanderie. De plus, certains écrits mentionnent la présence d'une cave à vin. Victor Bourgeois n'était pas le premier choix du maître d'œuvre, le docteur Paul qui avait demandé à Adolf Loos de lui dessiner les plans d'une habitation. La présence de Loos n'étant toutefois pas désirée dans le milieu du Deutscher Werkbund, il sera remplacé par Bourgeois. La première version de Bourgeois rappelle discrètement le bon plan d'Adolf Loos. La fenêtre intérieure du bureau du premier étage donne sur la cage d'escalier. Finalement, le seul vestige du lien entre le haut et le bas de la maison est la fenêtre verticale qui donne sur la cage d'escalier.
chaque façade est étudiée comme une composition graphique. La façade sud est très ouverte. Elle amène de la lumière dans la pièce de vie et le bureau. Plus pauvre en ouverture, la façade nord abrite des services qui demandent moins de lumière. La façade ouest est également très fermée. Et finalement, la façade est est très ouverte afin de laisser la lumière du matin pénétrer dans les chambres. Ok, um, I think, uh, well, we are almost done. I, I stopped it because, um, unfortunately, the language is, uh, is uh, in French, and I don't know if you understood. Apparently, initially, uh, the building was, uh, was uh, to be built by Adolf Loss, This was commissioned by, uh, by, uh, by a doctor and uh, the Deutsche Werkbund, the organization that built this colony, uh, didn't agree, I don't know for what reasons, to have Adolf Loos uh, be part of this. So then they chose uh, uh, Victor Bourgeois. And uh, you probably understood. It, it was a functionalist building uh, with three floors. On the first floor, the living room, and the kitchen and then on the top floor um, you know the the bedrooms so what she said was that the building had um, the, the, you know the three floors uh, destined for uh, specific clearly defined functions and that the facades expressed uh, the relationship with the cardinal point that they were oriented towards in the south facade with a lot of glass and the east facade also with a lot of glass, a little bit less, but the northern facade and the western facade with, um, with much less glass. Now in the southern hemisphere, it would be the opposite, of course. Anyway, um, uh, I don't think I have uh, anything else on the, on the, on the Victor Bourgeois presentation. Now this was uh, his uh, contribution to the Weissenhof, um, colony, uh, which is important. I was a little bit confused and I should have looked uh, back. Um, I know that Le Corbusier built a long building, but it seems the, the longest building there was by Mies, and I think I said uh, was by, by Le Corbusier. Uh, I have to look again at the site plan. Uh, I never saw actually uh, the building by Mies, but in this presentation on Vimeo, um, uh, I understood that the longest building there is by Mies, not by Le Corbusier. I have to double check this. But you see, in a way, the length of the buildings express the ego, uh, egos of the architects. Mies was the master, um, the, the author of the master plan. So he built the, the longest block of flats. In fact, uh, much larger his building than all the others and then follows Le, Col Le Corbusier, a little bit less long, but still very long compared to the others. So, uh, but the others had the chance to build the private villas while uh, Le Corbusier and Miss built, um, you know, uh, apartment buildings. So I guess, uh, you know, there was some, some kind of uh, compensation there or, or, or balance. So, Uh, again, I, uh, I, I feel a little bit uneasy because maybe I could have done a, a, you know, a better job with uh, Victor Bourgeois, but it was very, very hard to find information about him and sometimes confusing information. But at least we know that uh, we know of him now. And, um, you know, if one of you or even myself want to go further in detail, we can, we can do so. We also talked a little bit about Soufflo, and I also presented a little bit the Mansar who preceded Soufflo. And then uh, I would be very interested to know what you think about the sphere in architecture, because uh, uh, it, it's a subject that interests me, and I think it's a subject that we should talk about. 
Um, what do you think from, from what I said and from what you saw? Do you agree with the usage of the sphere in such a way uh, today by uh, some very important architects? 